Dr. Camila Saraiva, am I saying that correctly? Yes, perfect. Saraiva, um, thanks so much for, for chatting with me today. You're a postdoctoral researcher at the Federal University of ABC, which is a cool name that I now know means refers to the three municipalities of Sao Paulo it's located in. Um, and you're also Urban Studies uh, Foundation postdoctoral fellow, so congratulations on that, that award. Um, and we're going to talk about Brazilian housing policy and urban upgrading in particular. Um, so I thought, you know, for people that aren't familiar with the Brazilian context, maybe you could just give a bit background on favelas and kind of incremental housing development and kind of a bit about the history of how these neighborhoods came to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. Well, thank you very much, Paulo, for this opportunity. It's a pleasure for me to talk about this topic that uh, is my topic of research. <laughs> so thank you again for this invitation. Uh, to talk about uh, favelas in Brazil, we have a very large history of a large period. So uh, what I am going to say here is very brief introduction of the development of uh, favelas in Brazil and uh, or lands in English informal settlements, there is a whole debate about the about which terms to use to name the settlements, popular settlements. And uh, without going deep into this debate, I'm uh, calling favelas. There is a very the, the main popular name in Brazil, uh, right. but we also have have other terms here like Villas, baixadas, alagados, so all these terms uh, all refers to similar settlements mm -hmm. in terms of uh, precarity and in terms of um, not having the proper um, land title. Mm -hmm. and, and it's sorry uh, to interrupt is already, but is favela like a, a term in Brazil that is despectivo? Is, uh, like disrespectful is it does it like us does it mean like slum or is it just uh, okay. seen in a more neutral way yeah this is a great thing because in the past there was a like a stigmatization towards mm -hmm. this name towards favela i mean uh, more recently from the two three decades ago on and favela uh, the the term has also created a a uh, kind of identity. So people who live in favelas identify, started to identify themselves as favelados, as um, moradores de favelas, like uh, favelas dwellers, and mm -hmm. in in a in in a action of counter this stigmatized view and to build a positive image of them of mm -hmm. their effort of being there, of their uh, way of life or their creativity, and also to name their struggle for the right of being there, of, uh, of uh, receiving improvement of infrastructure and, and everything. So mm -hmm. it's not a, it's not a um, how can I say, a pejorative name? Right, uh, that's yeah. the word, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And then, so, yeah, so the his, a little bit on the history. On the history, well, the history dates back to the slavery times. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of difficult because the history dates back to our national land law, which uh, is from 1850. So in this law, this law uh, acknowledged that only um, only uh, the, the land could be acquired only by purchase. Mm -hmm. And uh, this means that ex-slaves -slave, in that time and soon ex-slaves, mm -hmm. because the abolition came uh, 38 years later, they, they didn't have money to buy mm -hmm. land. So you limited who, who was able to buy land to an mm -hmm. um, elite a white elite mm -hmm. and uh, so if you date back to the history uh, you 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 come to this point and also 
if you, uh, there was an, another uh, important historical mark, let's say like that, that comes in the 30s when the cities in Brazil start to develop it a little bit more uh, in, a, in a little bit uh, intensive way due to industrialization. So from the 30s, uh, there is a, it starts to have mass migration from the rural areas to the urban areas. And these people rely on the housing um, that was built for, uh, from the, built by the private sector. So in the rental market. Mm -hmm. And from the 50s, with the intense, intensif um, intensifying of industrialization, the rental market was not uh, able to house all these people. And these people then start to, to live. They, they need the, the, the jobs. They need to be in the cities. They, they, they wanted to be in the cities for having better conditions of life. The rural uh, environment was passing through a lot of transformations in Brazil that is common in many cities in Latin America. So and they start to occupy, to occupy vacant areas. Mm -hmm. uh, vacant areas because the market didn't want them. Uh, so slopes and areas near the rivers and uh, that's the origins of favelas in the main Brazilian cities, let's say. And uh, then you have to look to the housing policies in Brazil. So until the 60s, we didn't have major, uh, major uh, governmental body to, of, of housing production in Brazil. So if you think that we, we started this history in 1850 and uh, with urban development uh, taken on more intensively from 1930, only 30 years later, you have some kind of governmental body to right. deal with housing, with public housing, social housing production. And this is the Banco Nacional da Habitação, like a national housing bank. It was created in 1964 in Brazil, and it existed until 1986. So somehow of 20 years. Mm -hmm. So the problem was that in these 20 years, a lot of progress um, took place in the sector in Brazil like the creation of a specific, fund, a specific funds for housing policies. Uh, I mean, all the, the bureaucracy to, to put this production forward, but uh, there was no subsidies for the, the, the most poor. And uh, what the, the history and the data show us is that the production of the BNH, this National Housing Bank, privileged the, has privileged the middle upper classes instead of the poor because they, they lack of the capacity of repaying the investment for the state. Mm -hmm. The bank crashed in 86. And uh, from 86 to middle 90s, there was no federal, no national housing policies. Yeah. But the problems of the slums were, were, the favelas were huge in Brazil. So many um, subnational governments, many local governments, municipal governments, start to take place, uh, start to, to put some, some programs um, develop some programs to deal with the favelas program and mm -hmm. and uh, the, the, the the kind of these programs was uh, intended to uh, to bring infrastructure to these favelas uh, initially it was very they were very punctual uh, not very much planned so you 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 uh, we used to say that we had a uh, infrastructure without projects until one point that we have many projects without um, infrastructure now. <laughs> but, uh, at the beginning, it was something very, how can I say, very empirical, you know, mm -hmm. 
people from, from local governments went to the field to listen to this population, to, right. to, to, to acknowledge it, to, to, to be aware of uh, their necessities and to start to, to build infrastructure. Right. And, well, this, there is a whole international history of Islamic raiding as well. I'm mm -hmm. not getting to this point. Yeah, so that's that's a really great overview um, and a very interesting story. And and I mean, similar to like you mentioned to a lot of countries in Latin America where you have this rapid urbanization and basically governments ignoring the, the people coming from the countryside that didn't have money. And then those people just kind of figuring out places they can live uh, without getting kicked out. I wonder, so in, in some countries there was maybe more uh, invasion or squatting on public land or on private land like you say that was like unproductive private land on hillsides or near river banks but then in like mexico there was also a lot of uh landowners would just sell you know without without formally urbanizing the the land according to the according to the planning regulations they would just sell parcels um i wonder i mean i guess there's probably a lot of variation across brazilian cities in terms of uh, the origins of the neighborhoods that eventually became favelas. Was there was there one that predominates more, or maybe in in, I mean Rio is famous for the hillside favelas, but maybe that's just because that's what people see. Um, is there maybe you could I don't know if there's a city you know well and you know kind of more or less uh, the distribution of of neighborhoods in terms of their origins. Uh, yeah, we have something similar. I, I don't know Mexico City very well or Mexican policies, but uh, for what you have said, uh, I I see some similarity here in the Brazilian case. Um, from the 40s to 70s, more or less, uh, it was very common to sell uh, to to irregular sell the land that. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the land that don't uh, exactly fit to the normal, uh, to the built uh, and urban regulations right. at, from, at the municipality. So, uh, and this is because, and women, women say that until the 80s, the rule in major Brazilian cities was to evict this population. So, mm. Favela's eviction was the main rule in mm -hmm. Brazil. And, uh, and in this context, the irregular settlements proliferate because irregular settlements, they are irregular in terms of, uh, of uh, building and urbanistic standards, but uh, mm -hmm. people, cl people claim that they have paid for the land so yeah. they cannot be evicted. And, uh, but from the 70s, the cities were uh, already very large in Brazil and the regular settlements were uh, usually um, open in the, in the outskirts of the cities, in the mm -hmm. peripheral areas where the land was, was cheap and the, 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 the poor population could afford. Mm -hmm. So from the 70s, uh, it was something that uh, was it was a, how can I say, like a, a confl confluation mm -hmm. of factors. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the same time, the city is, is getting uh, very large. So for you to move from the very peripheral areas to the center, to from home to your job opportunities, it was getting very difficult, many hours, sometimes two, sometimes more hours in the traffic mm -hmm. and uh, for commuting. And also Islam upgrading is an alternative policy that, that, is, begin, that is beginning to gain more terrain. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, Islam, the Islams, the favelas, uh, becomes to grow again. Mm, interesting, interesting. And yeah, so then... Currently, we must say that we have, uh, well, I don't know numbers. I must say a little bit more about Sao Paulo. We have uh, more or less the same percentual of population living 
and in slums, in favelas, and in informal settlements. Uh huh. I see. In regular settlements. Uh huh. And the and the distinction is there like an official distinct government distinction between the two in terms of it, is the distinction based on uh, some kind of ownership claim versus yeah. you know no purchase claim because yeah. both neither one of them fits within the planning regulations but in the case of irregular settlements people they bought it they bought the land from someone. Yes, I think that the main differentiation is okay. the land tenure. Right. In terms of land tenure. Uh -huh. And then, so you mentioned the, the programs, I mean, so in Mexico, starting in the 50s, really, but then kind of continuing throughout the 20th century, there were regular, very, very different kinds of regularization programs for irregular settlements, depending on whether the land was originally public land owned by the federal government or public land owned by the city or private land that was invaded or private land that was uh, purchased irregularly. I wonder, you know, kind of maybe you can give a little perspective on the kind of the history of how Brazilian government, like the federal or local government have tried to regularize claims to land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in, in Brazil, both, um, both settlements, both informal settlements, both in private and uh, in public land are, um, are considered uh, to, to be upgraded. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I know that in, in some countries, there is, they have much more, how can I say, obstacles to regularize the private uh, informal settlements in private land. Mm -hmm. uh, in Brazil, it's, uh, it's since the 80s, when Islam upgrading starts to took, a, to took a, a more intense pace, let's say like that, uh, both private and public land uh, has been considered, both of the settlements in private and public land. And then mm -hmm. there are different instruments, let's say from the 80s, from now, there are also a lot, a little bit of uh, housing history in Brazil, that uh, in uh, 88, in 1988, mm -hmm. we had our uh, new constitution, federal constitution, after a period of uh, dictatorship. Mm -hmm. So the uh, Banco Nacional, National Housing Bank, ended in 86. And in 88, there was a very effervescent <laughs> social context in Brazil for democratization. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the housing rights, the right to the city was uh, one of the main claims of the population, mm -hmm. and together with the decentralization of housing policies. Mm. So from 88, the federal constitution recognized uh, the right of the people living for more than five years, more than five years without the, the owner re reclaim, claiming back the property. The mm -hmm. constitution recognized the right of this, this population to, to stay, to, to, mm -hmm. to, to stay in, in those areas. So and different municipalities, because, because of the decentralization, different municipalities also uh, approved the instruments mm -hmm. to regularize and to give the tenure, the land tenure to the favelas dwellers. Mm -hmm. uh, and from after 13 years of the national constitution, we have uh, uh, a piece that that is very internationally uh, recognized, that is the City Institute. Mm -hmm. and the City Institute, uh, how can you say, regulated the principles and the instruments that were, um, that were, uh, that, that were written in, in our constitution. So mm -hmm. from 2001, we have much more, um, it, it, it become much more, um, how can I say, uh, yeah. spread uh, in, in the country, the use of these instruments. Of course, 
we have uh, we, we didn't have we don't have a perfect situation it's still sure. many municipalities struggle to implement the instruments many uh, local governments even don't want to yeah but, that's what uh, but i mean in terms of the the legal framework mm -hmm. to to regularize public and private land in brazil it's possible mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I mean, the Brazilian comparison is so interesting to me because, you know, I'm, I'm studying in California how the state government is trying to create more and more rules that guide municipal planning activities and kind of put, uh, you know, standards and expectations around planning activities and this intergovernmental uh, dialogue that happens. And so in Mexico, also the federal government is trying to, very much inspired, I think, by the Brazilian history, is trying to create kind of a, a stronger federal oversight of municipal planning activities um, yeah. in many different areas, right? So I think that, I mean, in, in Brazil has been, I think, very influential. The city statute has been very influential in that, in that regard. Um, but also I, what I understand is that municipalities in Brazil uh, or have their own constitution or like they have much more kind of decentralized sovereignty than in, in most countries. Is that true? And, and how does that affect like what the federal government can tell?